Hello, everyone. My name is Michel. Thank you very much for joining us. And I apologize if I have to mute myself from time to time for coughing. I'm recovering from a bad flu that I hope will not interrupt us too much tonight. Today, I am delighted to host Dr. Simon Stott, the Director of Research at Cure Parkinson's, the well-known charity, Parkinson's charity, with whom Silver, No Silver Bullet have jo joined forces and teamed up for today's webinar. So it's a joint effort from both. Simon is going to talk to us about his main PD research takeaways from 2023 and the research results he will be looking for in 2024. But so before we start, I would like to remind everyone that this session is for information and education purposes only. If you are seeking medical advice, please make sure that you consult a medical professional, which is not us, as you can tell. There will be time for questions at the end of this presentation. If you want to ask a question, please use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. Do not use the chat for questions, please use the Q&A function. And for those of you who don't know us yet, No Silver Bullet is managed by Mark Lambert and myself with the aim of sharing Parkinson's expertise like we are doing tonight. We aim to help you and frankly, to motivate you to make informed choices on how to adapt your lifestyle, to manage your, to manage your symptoms and slow down the disease progression. We post the recordings of our webinars on YouTube and on Spotify. Thank you for all of you who have been watching us. Half a million views so far on YouTube is a big number. We're aiming for a million by the end of this year. And we also post short videos on TikTok and on Instagram. The details are available in the chat section at the bottom of your screen where you, you can find all the links that you need to reach out to those media, as well as on our website, nosilverbullet4pd.com. But let's come back to today's topic and to Dr. Simon Stott. Simon, thank you very much for agreeing to speak to us tonight. The stage is yours. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Michelle and Mark. And I'm just going to quickly share my screen and we'll be off. So hopefully you can see that. We can. And if it plays ball, we're Perfect. good. Yeah, that's great. Excellent. OK, so thank you. Um, and uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, good day to wherever you are in the world um, coming to this uh, session. My name is Simon. I'm the Director of Research at Cure Parkinson's. And uh, before I start, um, just some disclosures. My only disclosure for this talk is that I'm an employee of Cure Parkinson's. We're a research charity um, focused on disease modification in Parkinson's. That's all we do. And um, uh, for transparency's sake, wherever Cure Parkinson's is involved in this talk, um, I'll just have the Cure Parkinson's logo. Uh, this is the plan of attack for the talk tonight or today, good or this morning. Um, firstly, I'm going to put, try and put things in context for you with regards to where this research stands in the, in the history of um, Parkinson's research. Then we're going to look at a protein called alpha-synuclein, which has uh, recently had some interesting um, data um, in 2023, and we are looking forward to potentially interesting data coming in 2024. Then I'll give an update with regards to GLP-1 receptor agonists. This is a class of diabetes drug that's being repurposed for Parkinson's. And uh, firstly, looking at what um, insights we got from 2023, and then discussing what we're looking for in 2024. Then there's been a lot of interesting work quietly being done with um, experimental um, surgical procedures. And I know this is not a topic um, that everybody wants to um, hear about, but um, it's worth discussing just because there, there's, there is so much activity. And finally, I'll be discussing other interesting insights from 2023 and things that we should be looking for in 2024 uh, from that other interesting topics uh, basket. And I'll summarize at the end. So starting off just by putting everything in context, I like to start my talks with this slide because it helps to um, frame everything that comes next. Um, along the bottom is, is a timeline of um, years from when James Parkinson first described the condition in 1870 all the way through to today. And up the side of this graph is the number of publications, research publications that have been published with the keyword Parkinson's. And what you should know is that um, to date, there has been, or to, to the end of last year, excuse me, there's been 171,000 research reports published in total. But over 80% of them were, have been published since the year 2000. And to the, in 2023 alone, there was over 11,000 papers published. 
So the vast majority of the research has been done in the last 20 years. And every year, there's just more and more and more research. It's it's like a hockey it's like a hockey stick uh, graph. Um, but key in those years, going across the bottom of that graph, was 1997. We had uh, Leo and Kate on the big screen with Titanic. We had um, Tiger killing everybody on the um, golfing greens, and we had a radio-controlled car on Mars. And let's not forget Dolly. But in 1997, scientists made a really crucial discovery with regards to Parkinson's. They found the first genetic risk factors associated with the condition. They, they reported on a family of 574 members in the extended family tree, and 67 of them, excuse me, 61 of them had uh, developed Parkinson's. And when they looked at the DNA of these individuals and they compared them with the rest of the family, they found that uh, the ones, the individuals with Parkinson's had genetic variations in a section of DNA called the alpha-synuclein gene. And remarkably, just three months later, researchers in Cambridge up the road here in the UK, and also researchers in Pennsylvania, at, uh, in um, Philadelphia, excuse me, they um, discovered that alpha-synuclein protein is present in Lewy bodies. And these are the characteristic pathological hallmarks of um, a Parkinsonian brain. In people with Parkinson's, alpha-synuclein seems to stick together and aggregate into these brown balls you can see on the, uh, on the, on the right-hand side of the screen here, and B and C, uh, C being a, a good example of a, a, a classical Lurie body. And over the next 10 years, in the early 2000s, there was a gold rush of genetic sequencing and researchers were rushing in and looking for other um, sections of DNA that were associated with uh, Parkinson's. So in 1998, they discovered ge genetic variations in a gene called uh, Parkin. In 2003, it was DJ1. In 2004, it was Pink1 and Lark2. And now there's more than 80 genetic regions, so regions of DNA, where small errors have been found to be associated with Parkinson's. This doesn't mean that Parkinson's is a genetic condition. These genetic variations only affect about 15 to 20% of the overall Parkinson's affected population. But what's, what's most important here is that it gives, you, it gives researchers insight into the biology or, um, that is potentially associated with Parkinson's. And that's uh, what we saw, and um, that's what led a lot of research in the early 2010s. Um, researchers were very focused on developing a better understanding of the biology associated with these genetic conditions, these genetic variants. Um, and these would point them towards um, pathology that could be used or opportunities that could be used for therapeutic intervention. For example, there's um, one section of DNA called the GBA1 gene. And about 5% of people with Parkinson's uh, have genetic variations in their GBA1 gene. And it's associated with reduced activity of a particular protein um, that uh, the, this gene provides the instructions for. So maybe um, by enhancing levels of that protein, we could have a ther therapeutic intervention in Parkinson's. So during the 2010s, there was a, a mad rush to develop tools and screen for drugs that could be useful in modulating these biological pathways associated with these genetic uh, variants. And now in the 2020s, there's a host of clinical trials being conducted by both academic researchers and biotech firms and pharmaceutical companies um, with newly identified agents that are targeting very specifically this biology. Uh, so it's a very exciting time for Parkinson's research um, where there's real opportunity potentially to be modulating uh, or slowing um, and stopping the progression of Parkinson's possibly. And what I want to do is um, go back to that first genetic variation that I talked about in the protein called alpha-synuclein. Uh, because that's where, personally, I think there was one of the more interesting findings from uh, last year. 
So alpha synuclein sounds like a distant galaxy, but it's one of the most common proteins in our brains. And um, it, uh, it has a lot of functions inside of neurons, particularly involved with the communication between cells. But as I said before, in Parkinson's, this protein starts to clump together and aggregate uh, for unknown reasons at present. But um, it's believed to put that, that um, accumulation of this protein is believed to put stress on cells and potentially ultimately leading to their cell death. That's the theory, at least. Um, and researchers have um, suggested that alpha-synuclein could be being passed, this aggregated form of alpha-synuclein could be being passed from cell to cell. And this could be a mechanism by which the disease is progressing as the alpha-synuclein goes from one cell to another cell, it, start, it carries the pathology with it and it causes aggregation in that new healthy cell, ultimately um, causing stress for that cell and for that cell to die, but not before it's passed on to the aggregating form of alpha-synuclein to another cell. And so um, researchers have um, attempted to block this passing of alpha, this aggregated form of alpha-synuclein sticky protein. And one way of doing that is using antibodies. The antibodies are Y-shaped proteins. So you can see one here. This is a um, computer representation of what an antibody possibly looks like. They're naturally occurring proteins, but um, researchers or scientists have been able to manipulate antibodies and design them to target specific uh, proteins. And a lot of medication that's currently used in the clinic for oncology is um, antibody based. So the question was, can we design antibodies that can bind to this or, or grab this aggregating form of alpha synuclein and remove it from the body before it uh, can be passed on from cell to cell? And there were a set of a series of um, clinical trials that attempted to do this. And the two leading trials were led by, one was led by uh, the pharmaceutical company Biogen and the other one was led by uh, the pharmaceutical company Roche. And so there were the Spark and the Pasadena studies respectively. And um, after um, multiple years of testing their antibody, well, it was, it was one year um, testing the antibody in each study. It was 52 week studies for both. The uh, researchers unfortunately found no difference between the individuals who were treated with um, different doses of the antibody and individuals who were treated with just a placebo control. Um, they found no evidence, as it says in the conclusions on the bottom of the screen, no evidence of slowing of disease progression. And so Biogen decided, right, let's cancel this and let's walk away. But Roche went back and had a look at the data. They, um, they did a deep dive on the data and they found something interesting. So when they look at the placebo treated group, which is the blue line you can see on this graph on the left hand side here, um, the, the, the score up the side is the change in Parkinson's progression uh, motor score. Uh, excuse me, this is part, this is, um, UPDRS is the um, classical clinician-based uh, rating scale for, um, excuse me, measuring Parkinson's. And there is uh, four different parts that are quite often used for um, clinical trials. Part one, two, and three are the most commonly used. And part three being the motor scores. And when they looked at part one, two, and three in um, the data collectively, they found no difference between the blue line here, which is the placebo treated group, and the red line, which is everybody in the um, antibody treated group. Um, but then when they just looked at the motor scores, they noticed that the individuals who were treated with the um, antibody in particular, the alpha synuclein antibody in particular, had a reduced progression almost immediately from the start of the study. And then towards the end of the study, the 52 weeks, there was almost a plateauing of the um, progression. 
So there was a slowing down of progression and then the sort of st stabilizing of it. And they thought, this is kind of interesting. Maybe, maybe we should follow up on this. And so they did. They invited um, individuals. And this is the first real sort of interesting insight from 2023, uh, in my personal opinion, and which doesn't stand for much, but it's my talk, so I can decide what I what, what's interesting and what's not. Um, so this was the Pasadena Open Label Extension Study. And they invited everybody in the study to take part. Um, the first the three parts to it. Part one was the 52-week study that we've just looked at, where you had a placebo arm and you had two different um, doses of um, prazanizumab, um, which just rolls off the tongue so nicely. And then in part two, they shifted everybody to either a low dose or a high dose of prazanizumab, even the people that were on placebo. And then in part three, they put everybody on just a low dose of prazanizumab. And if you look at the numbers along the bottom, where it says N equals 316, that's the total number of people in the study. And then for part two, where they had this um, extension part, they invited everybody to take part and they had 310 people take part. And then for the um, part three extension, up to 60 months, of um, active treatment, they had 271 people partake. So there was genuine interest from the participants in the study to take part. Um, so that's, that's the basic design of what happened. One important detail to point out here is that between part two and part three, there was a small global event called COVID which kind of screwed up the um, study a little bit. There were, there were, there's a large gap of between three to 17 months where people weren't able to get to the clinic. Um, and the brochures treated this as a, as a washout period. So people weren't treated, um, but they were still being um, part of the study. So they could see what happens when you take the drug away. And when they looked at the data from this, and this was this data was presented last year at the Grand Challenges meeting in Grand Rapids, Michigan, and uh, the rallying meeting associated with that uh, that event. The graph looked like this in terms of motor scores. So this is part three. This is the motor. Um, these this is the motor symptoms of Parkinson's being assessed. And what you have is a gray line, which is slowly going up, slowly going up, 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 up. Um, across um, from the left to the right, up in, in an upward direction. But then, uh, and that that the important part about this gray line is that there, this can, this is a control group that's coming. The, the data is coming from the PPMI study, the Michael J. Fox Foundation PPMI study, which is hundreds of uh, hundreds and thousands of people involved in the study. They're being monitored, providing a um, uh, a living history of what Parkinson's looks like. It's, it's a very solid data set. But the two uh, lines on the bottom, the light blue and the dark blue, are the, uh, the, the groups who were either, are, are the groups who were treated with presenizumab. And at 12 months, I'm not sure if you can see my cursor here, but across the bottom is months of the study. And at 12 months, you can see that there is a deviation between all three lines, where the prazanizumab um, individuals just start to stabilize in their progression of Parkinson's symptoms, uh, motor symptoms, this is. And then at 24 months, there was that small event called uh, COVID that I was talking about, and there was a washout period. Um, so the individuals weren't on drug during that period. As I understand it, I might be um, incorrect about this. This was um, presented at a uh, conference and I might have um, missed the, some particular details. But then from 36 months onwards, the um, individuals are back on drug. And again, you're seeing basically a, a stabilization of um, motor symptoms. So it's, it's, it's really intriguing data and um, quite keen to see follow-up of this. And so is Roche. 
Roche, um, based on some of this data, Roche started a second uh, phase two clinical trial called PADOVA. It's an 18 month study involving 583, uh, 86 participants. And the uh, completion date of that study is this year. It's um, registered for um, completion in September of 2024. So it will be very interesting to see the results of uh, both studies. And I should add that caution must be taken here because Roche is very, very quick to point out that this is all post hoc analysis, meaning it's, anal it's, uh, the, it's analysis after the event. They um, uh, are very fast to point out that there is no control arm uh, within the um, data you've just seen, and everybody knows that they are taking the treatment. Um, so caution must be taken in terms of um, interpretation of this data, but it is very interesting because there was a moment when both the Spark and Pasadena study presented their results that everybody thought, right, so alpha-synuclein, targeting alpha-synuclein doesn't work, so let's just focus on something else. Um, and this new interpretation of some of the um, ex extension arm data is suggesting to us that there is something still interesting here to have a look at. And if nothing I've made sense, um, said has made sense, there's a video link at the bottom of this slide um, of a presentation that the Roche team gave at the rallying meeting. It's on the Cure Parkinson's web, uh, YouTube website, and I recommend um, viewers to go along and uh, watch it. And if you want um, that link, just email me at the end of this presentation. I can send you these slides. There's nothing in the, today's presentation that's um, confidential data. So um, just let me know uh, and I'll forward these slides to you. Um, but this brings us to um, uh, another interesting insight associated with Parkinson's um, from 2023. And that was the research that was published around the alpha synuclein seeding assay. Uh, so this is potentially a biomarker test for Parkinson's and some of the associated conditions, which could aid in the diagnostic process and um, help with future clinical trials. If you're testing an alpha synuclein targeting approach for Parkinson's, you want to be sure that uh, these, that these individuals are affected by the, this protein in particular. So, um, the Michael J. Fox Foundation has been driving a lot of this research. And last year, they published a very big study uh, exploring this um, biomarker test in a very large cohort um, and with, with very, very encouraging results. And uh, it'll be very interesting to see uh, what happens with this research going forward, potentially providing the community with a biological um, characterization of Parkinson's while we are still alive as, as opposed to a post-mortem brain analysis. And uh, one, one comment to be made here is that this assay um, in its current form is, uh, is a very binary test. They're meaning if, if you test positive, you either test positive or you test negative. So it says that you have Parkinson's or you don't have Parkinson's. Um, it, it, at present, there's not very good data um, suggesting we can track progression with this assay. But um, either way, it's a very, very useful tool for the, for the research community. Um, and now I just wanted to shift slightly, but still focused on alpha-synuclein. Um, the first thing that we're looking for in 2024 um, associated with this research is um, the small molecule inhibitor trials. So antibodies are fantastic. You can design them to bind to a particular protein and remove it. But one of the issues with uh, antibodies is that they don't get into the brain very well. They're very large molecules and the brain is protected by a skin, a, a membrane, a skin called the blood brain barrier. And al the um, Alzheimer's studies and the Parkinson studies have all found that um, antibodies don't get into the brain very well. And what we really need are small molecules that can block or inhibit 
alpha synuclein from actually aggregating or, or, or starting to stick together. And so biotech companies and pharmaceutical companies have been developing these molecules for some time. And uh, there's two clinical trials that have been ongoing um, over the recent years. Uh, one has been conducted by the pharmaceutical company UBC. And uh, I'm not even going to try to pronounce that name. I'm just going to call it UBC0599. Uh, was tested in 450 participants with early Parkinson's. And that study was um, has a completion date of April this year. So towards the end of this year, we're probably going to find out the results of that study. Um, and then there's the Inovus study. Inovus has been testing um, Posifem. It's, a, it's, a, it's an old molecule, but it's a very well-characterized molecule. Um, it, it is shown to inhibit the uh, aggregation of several different proteins. Uh, they've tested it in 520 participants over a six month period. And the study finished in late 2023. So we should know the um, results of that study very soon. But the important detail here is that these small molecules can actually get not, across, not only into the brain across that blood brain barrier, but also inside cells in many cases. Um, and so it can be blocking the aggregation of alpha synuclein inside of cells, um, preventing it from ever sticking together, let alone being trans um, communicated between neurons. So, excuse me, it'll be very interesting to see uh, the results of these, both of these studies in parallel um, and also um, in comparison to the um, antibody studies. Uh, but that, that's that's a real sort of um, event to look out for in terms of alpha-synuclein research in 2024. Um, and now I'm going to shift slightly away from alpha-synuclein and draw attention to the GLP-1 agonist research. And this is the second interesting insight from 2023. Um, exanatide is a diabetes drug that has been, um, efforts have been made to repurpose it for Parkinson's. So in, in 2017, the results of a 48-week study were published. The study was conducted here in the UK out of UCL in London by uh, Professor T Tom Holtonay. And it involved 60 participants, half were on exenatide, this drug, um, and half of them were on a placebo. And as you can see from the graph on the um, right-hand side of the screen there, uh, the individuals that were on exenatide uh, displayed an improvement, a reduction in their UPDRS part three. This is the motor scores again. So they, they showed a reduction in their scores, suggesting an improvement and a stabilization across the 48 week uh, period of the study. And then between 48 weeks and 60 weeks, they were uh, no longer on drug and there was a washout period to see um, what impact um, they had, the, the, the treatment it had on the Parkinson's. And you can see that they start to, to return to the uh, baseline, that, which is the dotted line running across the middle of the graph. Whereas the placebo treated individuals, they just continued to progress with their Parkinson's. That's the red line going upwards towards the right there. So that indicated that there's something interesting going on with um, exenatide. And this has been partly supported by um, another GLP-1 agonist study, um, liraglutide. Uh, again, this was a 52-week study uh, conducted in California, and while they saw no difference in the motor scores of the participants involved, they did see statistically significant improvements in non-motor um, symptoms. So it's adding to a body of research suggesting that this class of drug is having a beneficial effect potentially in people with Parkinson's. And last year, the, one of the big sort of insights was the um, presentation of the phase two clinical trials of Lixi xenotide, which is again, another xenotide like agent, uh, a diabetes drug that's um, widely used. Um, and they saw very similar results to the first um, study where they saw a improvement in the motor, uh, a statistically significant improvement in the motor scores. Of, these indiv of the individuals taking part in the study. And crucially in this study, it was a very large study. 
There was over 150 people in France who were treated with thalaxygenotide. And the study took place not in one um, central research center, but across more than 20 research centers uh, spread out across the country. So that, the, the benefit of this is that um, it's firstly a very high number of participants and they're spread out geographically. So there's no bi potential for bias from a particular researcher or a particular research institute. So it's a, it's a very encouraging study uh, or a very encouraging result suggesting that, um, again, there's something interesting happening with GLP-1 agonists in Parkinson's. Um, there were, a, a, in addition to all these sort of um, encouraging results, there were a couple of um, trials that didn't see the um, same outcomes. One of them was from a biotech company called Neurally. They conducted a 36-week phase two study um, and they missed on both their primary and their secondary outcomes, the primary being uh, the UPDRS part three score, so the motor symptoms. They didn't see um, improvements in, in the group as a whole. But what's really interesting in the data, and you can see it in the supplemental file of the paper that's presented, um, that's presenting the results, they observe an interesting effect in the participants who are under the age of 60. So when they look at the um, UPRS parts two and three combined in a subgroup under, under the age of 60, uh, in the left-hand graph here, you can see the gray line is uh, the individuals who are under 60 years of age, but being tr treated with placebo. And then the light blue and the dark blue line are the individuals under 60 who are being treated with the neurally drug. NLR, NLY01. Um, and then when you look at the right-hand graph, you can see that there's no difference between the gray line and the two blue lines in the over 60 population. So there's possibly um, an age-related effect in um, with, with this class of drug. Uh, and then the second biotech company um, supported study that came from a South Korean company called Petron who have developed their own GLP-1 agonist um, called PT0, uh, PT320. Um, and it didn't show a statistically significant effect in terms of motor score, but it did have a positive outcome in terms of daily living um, scores. And the company said that there is sufficient enough additional positive data in their um, data set that they are continuing to develop PT320. So there's a lot of data last uh, last year in terms of this diabetes um, drug that we're trying to repurpose for Parkinson's here. Um, and this is um, leading through to what we're looking out for in uh, 2024, um, the second thing that we'll be looking out for. Uh, firstly, we're expecting the results of the large phase three clinical trial of exenotide that's been conducted here in the UK. Again, this is Professor Tom Fultonet at UCL in London. Um, it's a two-year study involving 200 people um, uh, um, with Parkinson's, half of them taking exenotide and the other half on uh, placebo. And it's been conducted across six sites uh, around the UK. Um, and the results are expected in mid to late uh, 2024. And then there's also a phase two study that's been conducted in Stockholm and Sweden. And it's a very similar design to the original um, 2017 study of exenotide. Uh, 60 participants have been treated for 12 months with exenotide or placebo. And the study involve, also involves brain imaging analyses. So it'll be interesting um, to see that novel set of data. And we're, we're expecting the results of that come mid 2024. Moving on now to the um, experimental surgical procedures, uh, some interesting insights from 2023. Firstly, Blue Rock Therapeutics and Bayer, the pharmaceutical company, announced the top line results from their phase one clinical trial of uh, cell transplantation therapy um, for Parkinson's. They found that the um, treatment was safe and well tolerated in the 12 participants involved in the study after 12 months. 
the the data was presented at the movement um quarter meeting in Copenhagen. And um the importantly, the data was focused primarily on safety. These cells have been grown in cell culture from embryonic stem cells. So these cells have the potential to just grow and grow and grow and become whatever they want. And so the concern was that there would could be the potential for um, overgrowth of cells once they're transplanted into the brain in, in, a, in like a cancerous form. But um, there's no evidence of that whatsoever. And the preclinical data suggested that there's very, 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 very low chance of it occurring as well. And the cells are now evolving and developing and maturing um, inside the brains of the participants involved in the study. And hopefully, uh, after two years of um, maturation in the brain, there will be um, dopamine being produced by these transplanted neurons, and that will be having an impact on the uh, motor symptoms of these individuals. Uh, so the motor symptoms or the clinical assessment will start taking place. Well, the, 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 the real sort of measure of, of um, success will start from about 24 months post-transplantation. So it'd be interesting to see in, in about in another year or so the results of that um, analysis. But um, it's nothing slowing this um, this collaboration down. Bayer and Blue Rock Therapeutics are now undertaking um, phase two clinical trial, uh, which is expected to kick off and start enrolling participants in uh, the first half of 2024. And uh, the first, it, it, it's it's one of the first interesting trends in this particular field is that um, a large pharmaceutical company like Bayer has decided to step in um, at this point in time the uh, the research has matured to a point where they're ready they're ready and prepared to take the financial risk of um, serious clinical trial costs um, and driving this research forward for clinical approval and it's a it's a trend we see with um, some of the other studies as well for example, in the Kyoto study, Kyoto is uh, where a lot of this um, work has really sort of evolved. They've been running a clinical trial, their phase one clinical trial for some time now. And that trial is finished. The, the participants in the study will be followed up long term, of course, but the results are expected later this year. And um, a pharmaceutical company in Japan called um, Sumitomo Dainippon have uh, t stepped forward and um, uh, driving the uh, future development of this uh, research and they're planning they're currently planning phase two clinical trials both in japan and the us and here in the uk and europe we have um the stem pd study that's just recently kicked off in 2023 with um, a small pilot study of eight participants uh, they're being transplanted either in the uk or in sweden they'll be followed for three years the safety assessment like the um Blue Rock Therapeutics will occur after one year and clinical efficacy, whether the transplants have actually having an effect on symptoms will be determined after three years. And here again, that um, pharmaceutical industry trend is um, seen because Nova Nordisk has stepped in and they're funding this um, study and they're going to be taking the um, program forward from uh, phase two onwards. So uh, again, a, a very a very encouraging uh, investment coming from the pharmaceutical industry in this in this area. So the third interesting thing to look out for in 2024, in my humble opinion, is uh, future developments in terms of some of this um, research. Um, the first will be a um, a transplantation trial uh, coming from the Arizona State University's um, Biodesign Institute which is um, being led by Professor Jeff Cordow. It's a small phase one study. It'll involve eight participants uh, with, Parkin with the genetic variation in their Parkin gene. Um, folks with a Parkin mutation have a very, um, uh, have a Parkinson's, it's very focused on the dopamine neurons, typically. And um, so they, they, they represent a population of people who are perfect for testing this particular approach. And they'll be transplanted and um, followed up for um, three years. Again, with the safety being determined at one year, 
and the um, clinical efficacy being determined after three years. And another uh, biotech company this time looking to start clinical testing is Aspen Neuroscience. And they're taking a quite a unique approach in this um, field in that they have not only developed embryonic stem cells for um, a, a general population, but they're also looking at doing genetic um, correction inside of cells. So they take skin cells from a person with Parkinson's um, and they will sequence to assess whether there's any genetic variations, correct those variations, grow those cells into dopamine neurons, and then transplant them into the individual that they've taken cells from. Um, so this would be beneficial, not only from the standpoint of correcting a potentially um, vulnerable, a, a vulnerability associated with Parkinson's, but also the cells are the individual's own cells. So there'll be hopefully less of an immune response. And we're hoping to see news of uh, clinical testing of this um, approach in 2024. Last year, the FDA gave them the green light in terms of um, fast tracking their program. Um, so hopefully they'll be kicking off this year. And what's interesting in terms of the Aspen Neuroscience and Blue Rock Therapeutics um, programs, uh, this is a slight deviation, but it's of great interest, I think. Um, they're collaborate. Both biotech companies are collaborating with two tech companies. One's called Ruin uh, Labs, and they are looking at um, uh, wearable uh, devices, particularly the Apple Watch, in terms of um, monitoring people's symptoms and collecting information about uh, movement and activities. And then there's a rather remarkable company called Emerald Innovations. And um, they have a Wi-Fi box that sits on the wall. And usually Wi-Fi box does just emit um, microwave so that we can watch YouTube or play on our computers or, or whatever you do with your um, devices. But with Emerald uh, Innovations technology, their uh, Wi-Fi box not only um, emits um, microwave, but also receives. And so when um, the microwave is emitted from the box, it'll hit something and it'll bounce back and the receiver will pick it up. And the receiver can generate, uh, the, com the computer that they're using for an analysis can generate an image of um, the room and individuals walking around in the room. And they can monitor um, all sorts of aspects, aspect, aspects of life, such as um, speed of movement, um, but in combination with the Ruin Labs technology, you can imagine a very, very rich data set where you're monitoring sleep patterns, uh, movement around the room, around the house, um, all sorts of um, interesting data. So I thought I'd just mention that here. It's a slight detour, but uh, it's it's a it's of interest, and it's nice to see both biotech companies taking a keen interest in developing a really rich data set as opposed to just relying on clinical rating scales that occur once every three or four months. This 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 represents continuous monitoring. It's a bit big brother, I appreciate, but it's still gonna um, give us a very, very rich picture of uh, um, people's Parkinson's and, uh, and, how, and how it evolves over time. And other interesting areas of research in the surgical um, development uh, that we're looking out for in 2024 um, firstly, the GDNF work has been recently done. So GDNF is a glial cell line derived neurotrophic factor. And it, uh, many years ago, there was a clinical trial that uh, generated a great deal of interest. And this molecule was seen as one of the wonder drugs potentially for Parkinson's. Follow-up studies have unfortunately not been um, as encouraging, but um, it hasn't stopped um, researchers from continuing this research and a biotech company called Ask Bio has been using um, a gene therapy approach to deliver GDNF to the brain. So rather the GDNF is a very large molecule and you can't simply take it as an oral pill. It won't um, cross the blood brain barrier that I was talking about before. And uh, so what researchers have done is they've developed 
um, a gene therapy approach, which is using a virus to infect cells in the brain. A virus is a very useful biological delivery uh, tool. If you take out all the disease causing stuff, you just have a, 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 a molecule, a, a, an organism, it's not even an organism, it's just a, a, a machine that can deliver whatever you want to wherever you want. And um, what they've done is they've taken all the disease causing elements out of the virus and they've stuck the DNA of GDNF into it. And then they've injected the virus into um, the brain in a region called the putamen, which is where uh, dopamine neurons stretch their branches to. And in, in the putamen, the virus will infect the local cells. They'll start to produce GDNF. And G G the hope is that GDNF will have a beneficial effect, not only in protecting the remaining dopamine neurons, but encouraging them to actually grow new branches. Um, and they've had a, the Ask Bio have had a clinical trial ongoing for 18 months um, with 11 individuals having had this uh, surgical procedure. And they've recently announced um, the results that the, uh, the treatment is um, safe and well tolerated, and they are actively preparing for uh, phase two clinical testing, which should be initiated in the first half of uh, 2024. And again, it's interesting to note the pharmaceutical industry again here, taking an active interest, Bayer, uh, who have um, purchased the Blue Rock Therapeutics Company I was talking about before, they are, um, have also purchased Ask Bio. So I don't talk about it in this talk, but there is the potential for combination therapies where GDNF and a cell transplantation could be um, undertaken in future clinical trials. Uh, we, we, we'll have to wait and see about that, though. Um, and then there's also adaptive DBS. So this was been this has been under development for a while uh, by a tech company called um, Medtronics. Deep, deep brain stimulation is basically it basically involves placing a very thin wire into a particular region of the brain that's extremely active, hyperactive in Parkinson's, and you can um, dampen down that hyperactivity by simply passing electro electrical current, a sustained electrical current through that area. And so people have uh, a wire uh, implanted into their brains, and then a device a, a stimulator is pl um, placed in their chest, and a wire runs between them. And traditionally, DBS, deep brain stimulation, has involved a specific program of stimulation to that particular area of the brain. But what uh, Medtronics and others have been developing is a, has been called adaptive DBS. So it involves uh, recording brain activity and stimulating according to the needs of the brain or the, or the response of the brain. So whereas DBS is just a continuous stimulation of the same pattern, now we're testing an adaptive form of this. Uh, so the, we can record from the brain and provide stimulation based on whatever's happening in the brain. Um, and Medtronics has been conducting a um, single-blinded randomized study of 85 individuals with Parkinson's. And we're, we're hoping to see the results of that study in um, 2024, which is when the, the study is supposed to complete. So very interesting technology. Um, now, for folks who are not interested in um, surgical procedures, there was one particular paper the last year that I thought was really interesting um, in terms of lifestyle interventions. Uh, you might be familiar with probiotics and prebiotics, but if you're not, uh, probiotic is basically a live um, microbe that uh, can provide a healthy um, benefit in sufficient amounts, whereas the prebiotic and this is the one to remember for this talk. The prebiotic is the food for those microbes that provide the beneficial effect. So if you're taking a probiotic, you're taking you're actually consuming the microbes. If you're taking a prebiotic, you're supplying the food for those microbes. And there was a group from Chicago who published a um, paper, a very interesting paper. It was a very small pilot study, only involved uh, 20 people with Parkinson's. 
and they were only treated for 10 days. But what they found was that uh, by treating these individuals with a probiotic, a pre, excuse me, a prebiotic, <laughs> they're easily confused, uh, by treating these people with a prebiotic, um, that's uh, a high fiber prebiotic, uh, they had beneficial effects um, in um, terms of not just the um, health of the gut, but also um, they were, had reduced levels of biomarkers of neurodegeneration. So um, encouraging results after just a very, very short study. And it'll be interesting to see this tested on a, on a, on a longer time scale. Um, finally, I just want to, before I really sort of finish up and uh, take some questions, I wanted to bring people's attention to the EJS, the Edmund J. Safra Act PD um, clinical trial platform. This is um, an effort to accelerate clinical trials for Parkinson's. And um, Cure, Park, just, Cure Parkinson's took an early interest in this project. We funded a lot of the preliminary work, but the Edmund J. Safra Foundation have um, stepped in and provided a, a large grant to actually uh, help set the platform up. Um, the problem with a lot of clinical trials is that it's a bit like building a football stadium uh, playing one football game and then deconstructing the stadium. A lot of effort goes into setting up a clinical trial. Um, but then as soon as you finish the clinical trial, uh, it's, it's all, it's all, it all sort of comes to an end. And in order to, to um, do another trial, you have to rebuild the stadium. So you get this kind of picture that you have in front of you now where you, you build a stadium, you play the match, you, you deconstruct the stadium, and then you... Uh, rebuild when you've got another study to conduct. Um, and it's a very inefficient, very, very slow process and expensive. But um, what uh, is a better design is to have some sort of constant conveyor belt of um, with, a, with a supply of new experimental therapies constantly being tested. And this is where the ACT-PD uh, platform is of great interest. So the basic idea is going to be a multi-arm, multi-stage clinical trial or a MAMS um, clinical trial platform. So you'll be testing a placebo arm versus multiple treatment arms. And as the study continues, you'll have um, continuous analyses of the data as opposed to waiting till the end of this data to determine if it's having an effect or not, the treatment. You'll be having um, interim analyses all the way through the studies. And halfway through the, after the um, interim analysis has been conducted, you might find that one or two of those treatments don't work. So you take them away and you shift the participants to new treatments. So there's no stopping of the clinical trial. It's just a continuous process now. And there's hundreds of people are planned for each of these arms. And ideally, you'll have one arm, such as treatment one in this uh, in this diagram, which will go all the way through to regulatory approval. So there's no delay between phase two and phase three. It'll just continue all the way through until the regulators say, oh, okay, we've seen enough data, let's approve this. And you might have multiple treatments that don't show any sign of um, any evidence of having a beneficial effect, but you can just remove them and continuously add new treatments. So there's no build, it's just, you build, you build the stadium once and you keep playing football matches on it continuously. And this work, um, this particular type of um, clinical trial platform has worked for other indi uh, disease indications. There's the Stampede study, which has been conducted since 2005 here in the UK for prostate cancer. More than 12,000 men with prostate cancer have participated. And since um, 2015, they had when they published their first um, result that changed um, standard of care, uh, there's been multiple um, changes to standard of care as a result of this clinical trial. And the chap in the picture here is uh, Professor Max Palmer of UCL University. And as he points out, uh, you're speeding up, you're getting the answers to questions decades faster um, than you would in, uh, with any of the other tech, with, any, with any of the other approaches. So, and it's it, it potentially is exponential as you see the second um, standard of care change 
came in 2017 and the third came in 2018. So it's a, almost a compounding effect. It's very encouraging. And the results are also um, having impacts in the case of Stampede around the world, not just here in the UK. They're uh, impacting standard of care. And other neurodegenerative conditions are um, already testing this model. The um, motor neuron disease has got uh, the MD Smart platform, and the Multiple Sclerosis uh, Society has set up the Octopus uh, platform. And what's really cute, I'm just this is another side note, but what's really cute about the Octopus program is that they're collaborating now with Australia, and um, the Australian multi arm multi stage platform is called the Platypus, so Octopus and Platypus. I like that. I thought it was funny. Um, but uh, ActBD, it's something to keep an eye on. And if you're particularly interested, get involved in. There's a consortium of Parkinson's researchers, people with Parkinson's care partners and other stakeholders now collaborating in large working groups, planning out um, how to get the uh, project up and running. The treatment, uh, potential treatment candidates have been selected and there are now efforts being made to secure funding for this, uh, for this enormous project. So it's an ambitious project, but it uh, certainly is worthy of our attention. So just to summarize, um, some very encouraging results coming through from clinical trials involving alpha-synuclein and the diabetes drugs. There's a lot of cell transplantation studies now underway or about to start. Adaptive deep brain stimulation is um, hopefully going to be uh, revolutionary. And high fiber diet is being evaluated, and high, excuse me, high fiber supplement is being evaluated um, to see if it can modulate the Parkinson's microbiota. And I've just mentioned the Edmund J. Safra ActPD platform there again at the bottom. Um, if you're interested in a lot of the drug trials that have been mentioned, I would draw your attention to Kevin McFarling and team's uh, annual report that's now going into its fifth year. Um, and we're about to get started with uh, writing that up. And I will stop there. I'll take any questions. I'll leave this up in case um, anyone has any questions. Uh, my email address is there, it's just Simon at Cure Parkinson's. And as I said before, if you want a copy of the slides, please just email me and I'll forward them to you. But uh, thank you very much. Happy to take any questions. Thank you, Simon. Thank you very much. And uh, congratulations on a very holistic approach because you only you have not only touched on the topic of drug, drug and medical therapies, but you have also touched too on, on the topics of uh, um, trial technology, that, as we just did now, technology as we did at the adaptative DBS and even nutrition. So thank you for such a wide scope. Um, let's go to some questions. I have a question from Mark, here, who is basically focusing not only on the therapies, but on the real causes of multiple causes of PD. And he's asking which research in your view is going to have the biggest chance of finding the real cause or causes of PD? Um, I think <laughs> it's a tricky question to ask because I don't think we're talking about a particular singular condition. And I think it's going to vary from um, subgroup to subgroup or potentially individual to individual. Uh, it could be a subtle vulnerability in somebody's DNA that makes them, that leaves them vulnerable to um, developing Parkinson's and maybe exposure to some environmental toxin or um, not exercising enough when they were 20 years of age, kicked it, kicked it off. Uh, I think determining the cause is extremely challenging. Um, there's a lot of work in prodromal uh, Parkinson's, which is before the clinical diagnosis mm -hmm. and individuals who are um, acting out in their sleep um, have been found to be vulnerable to developing Parkinson's or loss of sense of smell, constipation, these sorts of things. Um, it comes back to no singular cause. And um, at, at present, I think a lot of the genetic work, which is pointing towards associated biology, is very interesting. Um, yeah, it's a tough question to answer, sorry. Mm -hmm. Uh, Don Kelly is asking us if you have any news on proteinopenia research in Sweden, Cincinnati. I don't know if that okay. rings a bell. 
He refers protein, to something it? called Pro Protein Openia Research in Sweden, Cincinnati. It looks like a US Swedish effort. I'm not familiar with it, but you, you may not be either. Uh, my apologies, Don. Hi, Don. Um, my apologies. Um, I'm not familiar with that one. Okay, look, he, he, he that can happen. There. You told us there were 11,000 11, research papers written in 2023. So I guess this is probably one of the ones you haven't read. Yeah, oh, man, it's one of the 10,000. <laughs> I, got, I got to the other 10,000, but not the one. <laughs> Another Sorry. question from Marker, who is asking whether alpha-synuclein is a cause or an effect of Parkinson's disease progression. That's an interesting point. Oh, man, that's, that, <laughs> that question's not hard. That's <laughs> going to get me in trouble. That's going to get me in lots of trouble. Because there's like there's like different camps. There's there are the, the cult of alpha-synuclein, and they are just diehard. Alpha-synuclein is involved with everything, and it's the cause. And, oh, um. All I, all I, I'm not a card carrying a member of that cult. Um, <laughs> I would rather just say that it is certainly part of the pathology. It's present in a lot of cases of Parkinson's, not every case, but a lot of cases. And um, it is. Okay, yeah. I'm not sure it's the cause, but um, it's certainly part of the response of Parkinson's. Thank you. Jackie is asking a question about uh, dietary changes. She basically has read so, that some symptoms of multiple sclerosis have been eliminated through reduction of inflammation through dietary changes, so the gut microbiome. And she would like to know your opinion on this for Parkinson's. You have spoken about fiber nutrition a second ago. Yeah, so there's a... Um... A lot of, um, sorry, my email is suddenly going off. Let me just turn that off. <laughs> People have already started asking for the slides. Um, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of research suggesting that there's an inflammatory component to Parkinson's and um, an anti-inflammatory targeting diet would be uh, a very useful starting point for folks um, um, trying to ex uh, explore their own Parkinson's. All I would say is just be careful with manipulating diet. Do it, talk to a dietitian or or your clinician because if you start manipulating your diet, you can't have a different re differential response to medication. Uh, it's 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 got to be carefully handled. Thank you. Uh, Andy is asking about UPDS. Uh, and basically saying that it is a relatively subjective score in his view. And yeah. he's asking how often do you report to the score? Do you know if it's weekly, monthly? Yeah, it's it's, it's a tricky one because it's UPDS is basically um, done in a clinical setting. And it's often it's done in the off state for people with Parkinson's in a clinical trial, uh, which is problematic. But um you often see people turning up to the clinic and having a good day with their Parkinson's or a bad day. And whatever whatever kind of day they're having, that's their UPDRS score for the next six to 12 months. Um, and as I said, with the um, Ruin Therapeutic, uh, Ruin Labs and Emerald Innovations, biomarker, wearables, Wi-Fi data, that's more of a continuous monitoring of Parkinson's symptoms. And I think ultimately that's where the future lies, as opposed to just assessing a person with UPDRS once every six months, just continuously monitoring. Maybe through the, the use of wearable technology, as we have seen in some more recent uh, trials in the UK. Um, another question from Marker, who is basically asking about the Roche study, but I think he asked a question at the time when you were talking about that one. It's more a general question uh, about uh, patients being kept on the same levodopa during the entire studies. We're looking at five-year periods of time. Uh, people, of course, will have different um, doses of levodopa over that time. Uh, do you know how Roche or other companies are taking this into account to make sure that they're comparing apples with apples? Yeah. So as I said before, it's post hoc analysis at the moment, and post hoc analysis is best considered hypothesis generating. Uh, it, it shouldn't be driving our 
decision making process in terms of um, what's working and what's not. It's it's simply what we need to test going forward. Um, I'm not sure about the details of uh, whether people are being kept on the same L-DOPA treatment. The the, mm -hmm. the public the publication uh, of this extended study hasn't been um, made available yet, but uh, maybe that's one detail we'll have to look out for. Another question here, thank you, Simon, is basically, uh, are you aware of any trials recruiting based on blood tests that would be linking the medication mechanism of therapy to the biology of the patients? Which is very personalized in a sense and not generic yeah. as it often is the case. There are some studies on the inflammatory side of things that are um, looking for particular biomarkers, but it's all pretty, it's still all pretty experimental. Uh, and no study at the moment is jumping to mind in terms of, I'll have to have a think about that one, sorry. I think that the point that was raised at the Barcelona conference is that when you start being very personalized with the type of patient you want on your trial, you end up with such a small percentage of the population that it is very difficult sometimes to recruit enough people who meet those conditions. But I think that actually uh, uh, filtering on on blood blood tests or other personalized medicine angles might be giving a better strength to the trials as well. But ultimately, that's what we were looking for, right? We want to personalize as much as possible. And there's technology now called um, digital twin, which is where you monitor a person over a period of time and you um, you look at, you, you do a Ruin Labs and a, uh, an Emerald Innovation sort of rich data set. Mm. And then you model that individual with digital twins um, while you apply a treatment to that individual or a placebo in a clinical trial. So each individual could potentially have a dozen, a hundred simulations of themselves. Mm -hmm. And you look for the deviation from that simulation. Um, so having small clinical trials is not as challenging as it was previously. It's all very, very, very experimental still. But um, it, you, you, you start to see where things could potentially be heading mm -hmm. with new technology like that. Thank you. Pilar is asking us whether you see or expect to see a shift in the direction of research from the, the focus on alpha synuclein to instead dealing with the underlying neuroinflammation and mitochondrial dysfunctions. We haven't spoken too much about mitochondria today. Yeah, so I think last year we talked about the, um, the UP study, the UDCA clinical trial, uh, which is looking at mitochondrial approaches. And there are a lot of clinical trials focused on mitochondrial um, interventions and um, there's been one study focused primarily on inflammation which is as a thioprin uh, but there's others uh, getting underway very shortly um ultimately we're looking at it, the monotherapy approach is is a bit restrictive and ultimately we'll be looking at combination therapies one of the um, potential opportunities coming with 2024 is if the GLP-1 agonist class um, has a positive result at phase three, you can start asking the question, well, if that's doing something interesting, can we have a synergistic effect by adding something else in um, to, do, to do something else that's interesting? Mm -hmm. um, so uh, is there a move away from alpha synuclein? Not sure. Uh, I think it's good that we're not putting all of our eggs into one basket all of them focused on alpha synuclein because it felt that there was too much emphasis on it for a while. But um, if Roche is correct and there is something to be explored still, then um, uh, I think it should be explored. But um, uh, the, at the moment, I th it feels like we're got, we've got a lot of activity going on across a lot of different targets, which is yes. very encouraging. Thank you, Simon. Uh, Pilar is also asking if you have an opinion on the use of non-invasive brain stimulation for PD. I'm thinking, I, I'm thinking, for instance, about the famous glove, uh, vibrating glove, or some recent publications I have seen about using stimulations even in the legs. So stimulating the brain through other parts of the body than the brain. 
yeah, the, the glove work is really intriguing, um, but we, we haven't really seen a good, solid, um, controlled trial of it. It's all, it's all been open label pilot study up until uh, now. But um, there's a, set of, a series of studies that have just been initiated in Stanford um, focused on the gloves. So it'll be interesting to see what data comes out of that. Um, and in terms of other non-invasive, um, it's all very still, it's still very experimental at this point. Yes. Thank you. A question from Edward, who is asking about Ambroxol phase three trial. I don't think we have touched on that one today. Or if I do, I apologize, I missed it. No, no. Um, the Ambroxol study. So last year, Cure Parkinson's and um, funding partners um, announced the initiation of the trial. But um, the issue was that um, we needed to have a reformulation of the drug in the in the first study, the phase two study, we had individuals taking 21 pills a day uh, for six months on top of their dopamine therapies. And uh, it's a really bitter tasting pill, not bitter yeah. on the tongue, but bitter aftertaste. So it was pretty heroic effort. And we knew um, at the start of the study, we'd have to have a reformulation. And um, that's we've got it down from 21, just three pills a day. And uh, hope we we recently we put out an update last uh, end, towards the end of last year, and we'll put out another one um, in the first quarter of this year, uh, providing uh, folks with an update of where of the timeline. Thank you very much. Charles is asking us about NLRP3 inhibitors in twenty twenty four, including selenoflast. Yeah, so uh, Roche has been developing selenoflast. Um, they've got a phase one clinical trial. Uh, ongoing at the moment, and they've, they've had um, um, some interest in that. And then there's other uh, NLRP3 inhibitors coming to clinical trial very soon. It, for folks who are unfamiliar, NLRP3 is a key component of the inflammatory response, and uh, it's been found to be elevated in people with Parkinson's. And so inhibitors of this uh, inflammatory response could uh, possibly help slow down the progression of Parkinson's. That's the hypothesis. And biotech companies have been developing NLRP3 inhibitors, not just for Parkinson's, but for other conditions as well. And ones that can, can, can access the brain are now being explored for neurodegenerative conditions like Parkinson's. Thank you, Simon. I'd like to say to our audience that actually um, we have 54 open questions, uh, questions we haven't answered yet. Uh, Simon has already very kindly answered 13. <laughs> so I'm very I'm kindly always... asking. I just want to manage expectations that I'm asking, first of all, please do not add questions because it's unlikely we'll be able to answer everything. Um, and uh, I think that we will try to do our best probably in, for the next half an hour, 40 minutes or so but we will not be able to answer all questions. Simon has been very generous to share his email address. Uh, from what I heard, you already were receiving emails as we were speaking, so you will become viral. I, I I've, turned, I've, turned, I've turned the email <laughs> off. And Ben Stetcher, um, yeah, Zion Williamson. Yes, thank you for answering, to answering that question because actually I don't know that person, uh, Zion Williamson, and I was He's actually- He's a basketball uh, player. He was a phenomenal, <laughs> it was a phenomena, phenomena coming out of high school and um, he's reached the professional league and. Uh, He's not quite living up to the hope or the hype. <laughs> um, you probably have seen in the press quite recently that there have been reports of a Swiss developed spinal implant, which improves walking of a, of a gentleman called Mark, I remember, in France or Switzerland, and yeah. prevents falls. This is, not, of course, not a cure, but it can help for advanced cases. Do you have an opinion yeah. about this? Yeah, it's pretty phenomenal video to, to watch of Mark walking around um it's n of one at the moment but the yeah. research team behind it have been working with people with spinal cord injuries and um i think in the next five to ten years we're going to see a lot of really interesting research coming out of out, out of these initial steps excuse the pun because <laughs> well it's of course it it is a a sample of one but actually for those who haven't seen it this is quite a if you look up our TikTok page, for those of you who are on TikTok, you will see a short video in which I'm talking about that. 
Chris is asking us about the GLP trials and, and is asking whether you have seen any kind of pattern that would explain the differences in results because some of them have between inverted commas succeeded while some others have failed to meet their endpoints. What do you read yeah. when you look at the, the data across the various trials? Yeah, so it's, diff it's, it's problematic to look at a class of drugs as a singular entity. Uh, individual drugs have different characteristics and with GLP-1 agonists, is, um, that it's referred to as di different biases, GLP-1 bias. They, GLP-1, the uh, peptide um, affects different biological pathways and some are biased towards one pathway while others are biased towards another pathway. Um, the, the warning that comes with GLP-1 agonists is that this is the class of drug that everyone's taking at the moment for weight loss. So there are some that are associated with significant weight loss. Semaglutide, for example, you, you will lose 10 to 15% of your, your weight. Mm. And in Parkinson's, we can't really afford that. Um, so that's, that's the, the worry with, um, if we have a positive result with the phase three study, are we suddenly going to have people just jumping on any GLP-1 yes. agonist? And that could have dire consequences, uh, mm -hmm. not only for the individuals involved, but for the field in, in general. Uh, if we have negative outcomes of people losing weight and becoming vulnerable as a result. But, um, and some of the GLP-1 agonists don't access the brain very well. Xenotide is pretty good. Semaglutide, not so good. Um, Loraglutide as well. So it's interesting to compare uh, the clinical trials where you saw a, um, it with the loraglutide study where loraglutide doesn't get into the brain very well. You didn't see a, a strong motor response, but you saw a, non, a, a good a positive non-motor response. Um, what I'd say is there's still a lot to learn in terms of this class of drug. It's still very early days in the testing of it, but... Um, yeah, the, the, we we have to be careful with our messaging in terms of this uh, this weight loss issue. Yes. So Caroline and Vicky have the same question, and actually, I'm sure that in the 52 open questions, there will be a few more asking. Where can we find out more about the work on high fiber supplements that you have mentioned? Um, it's uh, the the paper I linked to is um, one potential source um it's I would, I would say it's a small pilot study at the moment so we need a little bit more research on it before we get too excited um and the issue with um going with it with people automatically think I'll, I'll jump on a high fiber diet and that could potentially affect your constipation if you if you suffer from this so um, what I would say is talk to your dietitian or and your clinician before making any sort of abrupt changes to your lifestyle or your diet, simply because it can affect your medication. Yes. So a couple of great questions here. Let's just start with the one from someone called Boyton Boy, uh, which is a screen name, I guess. Um, no, we, we, there... we, know, we, we know who that is. We know who that is. <laughs> who is asking whether there are any interesting studies looking to understand more about the benefits of exercise. And I remember that was a topic in Barcelona. And for yeah. anyone following No Silver Bullet, you will remember uh, Professor Bas Bloom talking about that in uh, December 2022. But uh, are there any studies that comes to your mind, Simon, that you would refer people to? Yeah, so Professor Bas Bloom has got a study that's getting underway at the moment called Slow Speed. It's focused primarily on people who are in the prodromal state, so before diagnosis of Parkinson's, and trying to encourage them or, um, to be more active and see whether a graded form of that can have an impact on um, progression into Parkinson's. Um, there's uh, another study called STRAT PD, which has been, um, STRAT 3, which has been conducted in the US um, which is looking at high intensity exercise for Parkinson's. Uh, there's, there are quite a few studies ongoing at the moment for Parkinson's um, and exercise. So, um, but the, the, the takeaway message is that any sort of exercise, 
is um, beneficial for you, not only from a physiological standpoint, but also so that um, exercise can be quite social. It gets you up and out of the house. And um, the one, the key determinant uh, for Parkinson's progression, the number one determinant for Parkinson's progression is social isolation. This is amazing. I'm so happy you mentioned that because I remember that from uh, uh, Laurie uh, yeah, Ashley. Laurie, Laurie Michelis. Laurie Michelis study. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is something that is not often talked about that loneliness is one of the main uh, drivers of uh, bad progression of the condition, which is amazing. Yeah, particularly coming out of the COVID pandemic, that was, that, that was yeah. a bit of a worry. So uh, Rich is making a, an interesting point. He's basically, first of all, saying it's a great presentation, lots of reasons to be optimistic, I agree. But his trouble when he, saw, when he sees trials looking, for example, for people diagnosed within the previous three years, and uh, he feels this is a, a very crude approach. And can we foresee significantly robust biomarkers that would be such that everyone with PD could participate and be measured appropriately? Uh, yeah. So, what you what you what we'd ultimately be looking for is large clinical trial platforms of this just continuous conveyor belt of um, experimentation, testing all sorts of different stages of Parkinson's, building up really rich data sources. Uh, and there are studies at the moment ongoing that uh, are not very restrictive in terms of going for that early Parkinson's um, stage. One of the problems with going for very early Parkinson's is that uh, it's quite difficult to assess progression during that period of time um, with UPVRS. Maybe the, the wearable data um, studies will change that, but um, uh, there, are, there certainly are studies that are less restrictive in terms of um, stage of Parkinson's. Uh, I'm not sure if I've really answered the question, but um it's a complex question and uh, you're doing a yeah. good job at it um dopamine warriors boxing club is asking us the sixty-four thousand dollar question i let you finish your glass of water so you can think about it in your view simon how long before we will have a disease modifying drug i'm going back to my glass of water <laughs> uh. Um, no, at, least, at least a drug that would slow down progression, if not reversing the symptoms altogether. Yeah, so I don't like this question. It's the question that's always asked. And um, the, the, the answer that a lot of people give is, you know, within five years or within 10 years. And that's just this constantly moving <laughs> uh, target, it seems. Um, I think within my lifetime, we see disease modification. And within my, within my daughter's lifetime, we see remission or eradication of the of the condition just with the amount of research that's ongoing at the moment but um with uh she's 11 just to put that in context for you um she i think though it's important to appreciate it's important to go back to that um part that we we're talking about with regards to different types of parkinson's so it might be that the glp1 agonists are useful for people of a particular age or a particular demographic or a particular yes. body mass um, and not for other people. But that's okay because we've got mitochondrial approaches or anti-inflammatory approaches. Um, mm. So to say, when are we going to see something for a disease-modifying therapy for Parkinson's? Um, it's, it's a It's a... It's a really tough question because number one, I don't think we've got just a condition known as Parkinson's, and we've got mm -hmm. so many different approaches being applied, being tested and applied at the moment. Um, yeah, as I said, I agree. Sort of I agree. There's just not to too, spend too much time on this. I think that actually I wanted to ask it because I know it's in the back of the of many of us of the minds of many of us. Um, but I think that actually, as it is a very complex condition, the likelihood is that we will find things that may help a small percentage of us or that we will need to combine different therapies together to achieve results. Uh, someone was asking about exercise, and I can't help thinking that actually exercise and social relationships, as you mentioned yourself, Simon, are critical things that are within our grasp. And that if someone was uncovering research about a drug that was having a similar impact as exercise can have on us, we would all be dying to have it. So we can, there are things we can do 
as we wait and hope for uh, disease modifying therapies. Um, talking about stem cell therapy, uh, Tim is basically uh, saying that actually so, for, so few people are chosen for trials. What should he do to get involved, bearing in mind that he has also seen that some of those trials are by invitation? I think that the Roger Barkel trial, Barkel trial and University of Lund was like eight people or something. Yeah. So how, how do you get your name on the list um, of uh, certain trials, whether it is stem cells or generally speaking? Yeah. Um... That's a, uh, that's a very challenging question as well. I think it's just simply, firstly, you've got to be taking part in the research um, that's being conducted at those institutions um, and be of a particular, have the ca particular characteristics that they're looking for in order to uh, um, take part. What I would say, though, is that the individuals who are taking part in these early studies are really very brave pioneers. I um, mean, these are, these are the first people who are heading for Mars. Um, the, 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 it, it, there's a lot of hope and excitement around stem cell therapies for people with Parkinson's, but it's still very, very experimental. And once you put the cells into the brain, you can't take them out. So um, if you are considering taking part in that research, give it serious consideration yes. um, and get involved in the research at those institutions. To be frank, uh, I can't get out of my head the words of warning of Roger Barker when he spoke at the Cure Parkinson's Research Day in 2022, uh, when he basically, and that video is on our YouTube channel, where he was talking about the fact that despite the fact that uh, stem cells is still at the trial level uh, around the world in very small samples, and you touch on some of them, there are many companies offering those services uh, although they haven't been trialed properly. So this is definitely an area where I would just basically say to the previous question uh, to be very careful about and um, that the samples are so small and the repeatable places are so few that I think that this is one that will be uh, one to watch for the next five or 10 years. I'm, I'm personally not expecting stem cell therapy to necessarily help me uh, in the next, uh, before the next 10 years at least. I don't know if you agree with that, Simon. Um... Uh, I was, I, well, I, I'm not sure if I agree or disagree. It's a diplomatic answer. Uh, what <laughs> I would say is, um, it's the one, the one, one of the important details with the stem cell transplantation stuff is that it's not tunable. So once the cells are in, you can't sort of mm -hmm. take them out or reduce or manip modulate the level of dopamine that they're going to be producing. And that's where I still lean towards. Um, DBS, deep brain simulation, because you can just turn up the volume or turn down the volume as required. Yes. Um, it's 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 uh, tunable. It's, it can be modulated as opposed to whatever you get with um, stem cell transplantation, uh, st stem cell transplantation, or um, high frequency um, ultrasound. Um, it's 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 a one shot, one deal uh, situation, and if you overdo it and, and it could it, it's it's still so experimental i don't think mm -hmm. enough people appreciate that yeah thank you simon uh richelle fanagan hello richelle one of our recent speakers on women and parkinson's uh, richelle is asking is making a comment about the diabetes meds looking very promising and there seems to be a link in her view between diabetes and dopamine so do you think that perhaps looking at people with pre-diabetes from a prodromal perspective might be useful yeah. So, uh, hi, Rochelle. Um, Rochelle is a phenomenal uh, um, advocate for the Parkinson's community and dietitian as well. So she knows what she's talking about in, in, in this domain. Um, uh, we Cure Parkinson's funded a research study conducted by again Professor Tom Fultonay, where they looked at people who were taking who had diabetes and were taking GLP one agonists. And what they found was that if um, that you had diabetes and you were taking a GLP-1 agonist, your chance of developing Parkinson's was cut by half. <laughs> and um, people with diabetes have a increased risk of developing Parkinson's, um, according to a lot of the epidemiological data. Some of it's been questioned recently, but um, most of the data suggests 
that, um, that, that they, they are at increased risk. So based on that, there is uh, a strong argument for exploring GLP-1 agonists in um, the prodromal cohort, these people who are acting out their, 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 their dreams and lacking a sense of smell and at risk of developing PD. But uh, it's a really good question. Thank you. Then I'll give you another one from Michelle. And then I will move on to other speakers. But actually, it is uh, one of our favorite topics and, of course, a very important one. Uh, roughly 40% of people with Parkinson's are women. Uh, do you, what do you think about the personalization of research, in particular on the sex basis, and the focus or lack of focus on hormones as a route for developing therapies for PD? I've got to answer this question really carefully, otherwise we're going to lose 40% of the uh, viewers. <laughs> Uh, um, it's a, it, what I would say is that it's an extremely under-researched area and um, Re Rochelle and colleagues have done a fantastic job of um, bringing it, this to uh, the, the attention of the research community. Um, with uh, Cure Parkinson's, we have a, um, a drug selection uh, program called the International In Clinical Trials Program. And... We have been exploring uh, some molecules that could be having a particular sex or gender difference um, with them ha potentially having a, a more of a therapeutic effect on women than men. Um, there's still a lot of preclinical research, we think, required to uh, support those going forward to clinical trials, but um, it is an area that is being explored um, within the research community, because you can learn a lot, yes, potentially about Parkinson's by knowing the differences between men and women. So another question, a very good question from Shazia, who is basically saying that there wouldn't be a research lecture lecture in 2024 without asking about artificial intelligence, of course. And she wanted your view on the potential of AI for drug discovery, but also for certain aspects of Parkinson's treatment, such as monitoring symptoms. And then adapting accordingly, a thing like, for instance, adapting DBS was an example of that. Yeah. Um, so I know everybody's excited about AI, but uh, AI kind of scares me. <laughs> um, not from the standpoint of what it can do, but what we will do with it. Um, a few years back, um, Cure Parkinson's and Parkinson's UK uh, collaborative, collaborated with um, Benevolent AI, um, an AI company here in London, uh, with with um, the goal of taking all the research that's out there and identifying molecules of interest for um, drug drugs that could be used in clinical trials. And the AI gave us all sorts of things, all sorts of responses. It was a really fascinating experience because. You, it, it, it felt very Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy where you ask the computer a question and it gives you number 42 <laughs> answer. Um, and you wondered, you, you were left wondering how on earth did it come up with this particular drug? And there's no way to actually go back and uh, find out because you give it a question in English, it works it out in its AI language and then it comes out to you with an answer in English. So it's a real black box um, stuff. And um, it also depends on the quality of the data that you put into it. And that's the, the real key to it all, how clean and how good is the data. And if um, half the data or if one tenth of the data that's been published is not of a high standard or high quality or has questionable results, then it's muddying the water that you're um, analyzing. Um, yeah, I think AI is going to do fantastic things. I'm not sure we should be putting AI in charge of adaptive DBS, but um, it's being explored in lots of different ways. And the, a lot of the data analysis that we're currently doing with like the Emerald Innovations work, that's a lot of that's AI based. So it's certainly helping in certain uh, areas. Thank you, Simon. Uh, by the way, anyone wanting to uh, listen to uh, wonderful videos about this, Lauren Kalia from Toronto, uh, who basically is supported by Cure Parkinson's, 
is touching on that the topic of using AI to pre-select um, uh, drugs that could have uh, basically side effects that would be beneficial to Parkinson's. Uh, this is a video you can find. I think it was like two or three months ago. Yeah, she's a rock star. Um, she is. I love her. Uh, Barbara is asking about something really quite interesting, and I know some people are extremely focused on, which is basically a theory that the characteristics of chronic stress and Parkinson's disease are very similar. Now, remember Rick Elmick, who works for or with Professor Bas Bloom, is a, it's also one of the, the videos available on our YouTube channel. He's talking about chronic stress being uncovering an, uh, an underlying Parkinson's situation. Um, what is your view about... Uh, uh, the, 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 the links between chronic stress and Parkinson's disease, as well as the, the impact of what she calls, Barbara here is calling the fight, free, the fight, fright, free state that uh, people find themselves in, uh, in chronic stress, and that might be related to similar symptoms of tremor in Parkinson's. That's a really interesting concept. Wow. Um, yeah, so the second part of that, uh, I, I'm not um, sure about, but it's a really interesting idea. <coughs> in terms of the first, it's... <laughs> Stress is certainly seen as um, one of these environmental, um, uh, not toxins, but um, it, it, it's a, a stressor that can have an, a, 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 certainly have an impact. Um, <coughs> I'm not, I'm not so familiar with that research, Sorry, so I, should probably, I should probably shouldn't, I should probably shouldn't say so much. But I, I know that people have looked at it and the bi biology associated with it. So um, it is certainly, a, it's, I think it's certainly considered a environmental stressor. I think for Barbara or anyone interested in that, that video from Rick Elmick is really interesting. Uh, it is on our YouTube channel. It talks about chronic stress uh, and Parkinson's. Uh, Mike is raising an important point, which I wouldn't say keep me awake at night, but has really troubled me. He basically says that uh, with PD being seemingly a collection of subgroups of people, um, there is presumably a risk that a treatment is successful for a very small subgroup, uh, but that this is hidden in the overall results and a potential successful treatment would be missed that would be applicable yeah. to a small percentage only of the population. What is your view about that? Yeah, yeah, this is what keeps me awake at night as well. We might have something that works really well for three people out of 100 and they benefit from taking part in the study. And then we take the drug away from them and we tell them it had no impact. And that's uh, 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 you know, detrimental to them and uh, community in general. Um, and we are now sort of seeing a lot of post hoc analysis of um, previous clinical trial data. So one of the great one of the great uh, resources that groups like the Michael J. Fox Foundation, NIH, um, and um, um, ASAP, um, ASAP, these large funding bodies are making available, uh, they're taking all the clinical trial data and pooling it in one place. So you can, if you're a geneticist, you can go through and look at the DNA of some of the people, of some of the trials and see if there's individuals with a particular variant that responded to a drug. Um, and that can be hypothesis generating. You can go and conduct a clinical trial looking for those individuals with Parkinson's in that particular variant. But um, it's a, it is a concern for um, a lot of people in the research community, I think. Stephen Moto, who is one of the earliest members of No Silver Bullet uh, and a GP and a PWP like us, uh, is basically asking about some newer forms of L-DOPA. Uh, he mentions, for instance, first level DOPA, yeah. And he's asking two questions. Is it likely to be available in 2024? And do you think it can make a significant difference to the clinical or daily management of Parkinson's? So Prodeo Dopa is, uh, is available in um, uh, the European Union now. Uh, I can't remember if it was this year or the end of last year that they, they announced. But um, this is a subcutaneous version of um, L-Dopa well, that comes from AbV. So it's a just a tube that goes into your abdomen and gives you a continuous supply of L-DOPA at a standard rate. So you don't get, with the problem, one of the problems with L-DOPA is that you take a pill in the morning and you get a spike of L-DOPA and then it drops off and you take another pill and you get a spike. And it could be that this spiking behavior is having a detrimental effect on um, 
the receptors associated with dopamine. Um, and so having just a continuous state of, uh, or continu continuous flow of L-dopa could get around that problem. And the data that was presented last year at the uh, Movement Disorder um, Society meeting was pretty impressive with um, regards to the uh, AbV um, treatment. So it'll, it'll be interesting. I've, uh, in fact, one neurologist I was talking to said this is going to kill dope, um, deep brain stimulation. Um, but deep brain stimulation has beneficial effects that that treatment doesn't as well. So it's, it, it's a bit of a exaggerated um, statement. Hmm. But it's um, yeah, it's 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 really interesting. Thank you, Simon. Someone anonymous is asking about the keto diet and intermittent fasting. I seem to remember you and I having a chat about this. That both of us are doing intermittent fasting. Simon, you and I, yeah, not together, but uh, on, <laughs> on you know separate lives. Uh, do you have an opinion on that? Or I, I think you would probably be a slightly biased. Um. The worry, the worry with um, with both is that um, it's the weight loss issue again. Um, I, I don't, I just don't think there's enough research that's been published at the moment and peer reviewed reports to support one way or the other. Uh, it's a bit challenging in, in that regard. Yes. I think that's that's right. And actually, again, not to uh, sell our YouTube channel at every opportunity at the turn of the road, but we do have a lot of videos there. And one of them is the interview of Matthew Phillips, Dr. Matthew Phillips from New Zealand, oh, yeah. uh, who, who is a specialist in keto and uh, intermittent fasting. From what I do remember, having listened, of course, uh, directly to his presentation, is that um, he basically he has been looking at PD with a relatively small sample for a limited period of time, just for cost reasons. But that research is still encouraging. You can have a look at our website or our YouTube channel. Um, there is a, a follow-up uh, video more recently that we posted as well about Matthew Phillips and uh, talking about uh, uh, nutritional therapies uh, for uh, basically not only for Parkinson's, but for similar conditions. So you can find more information there. Um, I just add to that there is a, there is an absolute poverty of uh, research on nutrition in Parkinson's. Uh, it's a it's, it's a real problem. Yes. So we do have actually uh, two people asking about the Q1 medical device, which is basically that device that you stick on your chest, uh, and asking whether you have any views about it. Someone is asking about feedback from our listeners. It's a bit difficult for me to do that. Um, but actually, I don't know, Simon, if you have looked at that. This is, again, I guess, part of those uh, technologies that aim to stimulate the brain in a non-invasive yeah. fashion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cueing. Um, I, I, I haven't. I've had a lot of people asking me about it, and I just haven't. I feel bad saying this, but I haven't got around to actually having a look at it. I'm fam familiar with it on a very basic level, but I understand. I think um, you guys had um, one of them come and give a presentation here, didn't you? Yes, there is a video again. I'm so sorry uh, about the Q1. <laughs> uh, I would just basically say that uh, if I do remember properly, this device, well, first of all, has a waiting list. It's not available everywhere in the world. So you need to contact them via their website. I do think they have a, uh, a policy of returning the device if it doesn't work for you. So um, it's quite an open company. There is a video on our YouTube channel. You can listen to it and decide whether you want to give it a try or whether you think it will work for you. They have published um, some research, but it's all um, there's no there's no control arms in in the studies, and they're very they usually, they have been small studies to date. Uh, I'm not sure if they're conducting large larger trials at the moment. But, in uh, a very similar kind of like uh, avenue, which is basically technology, Pam Pamela is asking about photobiomodulation or mm. red light therapy. Uh, you now we have started to see some results coming out, in particular sponsored by Symbix, who we have interviewed as well not that long ago. What is your opinion about the technology? Um, again, there's simply not enough um, research that's been done on it. There was a study that was presented a few years back at Hong in Hong Kong at the MDS meeting that uh, suggested beneficial effects, but there's been no follow up to that. So. Um, but the the 
uh, the the theory makes sense in terms of circadian rhythms, et cetera, but um, whether it is actually having a, a beneficial impact, I, I, I don't know enough and I can't comment. I'd like to say that we have actually three videos or four videos on that topic. Two of them are relatively old. Well, old, all is relative, like two, two and a half years old. Uh, and they are talking there basically by Catherine Hamilton from Australia, who produced the, produces the Coronet. Um, and then a more recent one is by Dr. Wayne Markman, who is talking about Symbix. And this is basically an interview we did in uh, November this year. Um, I just hope that my headphones are still working because I heard a dropping sound. Can you hear me? Yep. Perfect. So we just basically say visit our, our, our YouTube channel to, to view videos on red light therapy. This is one of the most viewed topic on our channel. Um, so, and actually Donna is asking about uh, Dr. Jonathan Sackler Bernstein, who was talking to us a while back and will be reinvited in June this year, uh, June or July, Mark, you will have to correct me. Uh, I don't, is that right? Uh, yeah, June, I think. In June. So Sam, Sam, and I don't know if you have any comments on Dr. Zachner Bernstein's uh, approach to, to uh, basically dopamine and Parkinson's. Uh, it's a very interesting theory. Um, again, we just need more research on it. Understood. I think we have answered 40 questions. We're going to get to the end of our, uh, of our session. Uh, I don't know, actually, Simon, maybe the, the best way for me is to, you, you can have a look at the questions if you want as well. We, there are quite a few uh, that we haven't talked about. A lot of them are about Ambroxol. So I see repeat questions on topics we have, we have basically covered. Uh, Q1 we have spoken about. I think we have done a really, relatively good job here uh, answering more than question, 40 questions. And when I look at what is still open, a lot of them are covering topics we have already covered. So my suggestion would be to put an end to the session tonight, which has been very productive and has been extremely wide ranging, Sam. And I think you started uh, compliments to you with already being extremely inclusive, not talking only about uh, medicine, but also uh, basically technology, nutrition, and even trials platforms. So you have been extremely all encompassing and we have basically uh, walked, we walked you left and right on the whole spectrum of the many solutions working or not working or still being tested for Parkinson. So thank you very much for your patience and for all your time and also for all your dedication because something I didn't mention in my introduction is that not only you are the director of research of Cure Parkinson's or favorite charity, but you are also the person behind uh, the Journal of Parkinson's, sorry, the, the, uh, the Science of Parkinson's. Oh, well, I haven't had much time for that recently, <laughs> unfortunately, but um, I'm trying to get back into it. But for those of you who are not familiar with it, Google the science of Parkinson's and you will see that there is a, a ton of information published by Simon, uh, who is basically tackling extremely complex topics very, with very simple words and tracking the right balance of not losing the information and not losing his audience. So thank you very much for this, Simon. Welcome, welcome. And before we say goodbye, I just wanted to repeat to everyone who hasn't heard it at the start, our next session will be taking place on the 12th of February, Monday, the 12th of February. Um, Dr. Raul Martinez will be talking to us about MRI guided focus ultrasound. Now, I saw a couple of questions about focus ultrasounds in the list today. We haven't tackled that on purpose. Wait until the 12th of February, and you will, need, you will know everything you wanted ever to know about focus ultrasounds. So, thank you very much to our audience. Thank you very much to Simon, and have a good day or good night, depending on where you are in the world. Bye bye. Thank you.